Okay, so hi, um, I'm Natalie Williams. I'm a PhD student at the University of Birmingham, and this is a work that I've done with Geraint Pratton and Patricia Schmidt on prospects for distinguishing dynamical tides in inspiring binary neutron stars with third generation gravitational wave detectors. Now, that is a huge mouthful, so let's break that down a bit. Um, so what are dynamical tides? Well, neutron stars are extended bodies, unlike black holes, so they produce tidal forces, just like the moon on the Earth. And in terms of gravitational waves, this corresponds to an induced quadrupole moment on each companion. And this causes energy dissipation and faster merging of the system than it would be with a binary black hole system. At low frequencies, we model the induced quadrupole moment and the tidal field as a linear relationship with the dimensionless tidal deformability, lambda in this case, um, as the constant of proportionality. Here I've seen it, as you can see in this graphic that I've made here, I'm trying to show these, uh, these tides here. These are, these are called adiabatic tides at this low frequency. Um, and they, the dimensionless tidal deformability in this case is a physical deformation of the star. Now, these lambda values, these are dependent on the currently unknown neutron star equation of state. And we were able to constrain these for the very first time with GW170817. Now, at high frequencies, this linear relationship actually breaks down as the system approaches a resonance with the fundamental oscillation modes of each neutron star. This is denoted as a fundamental mode frequency or the F mode frequency. Um, and these are these omega values here. So A and B of neutron stars in this case, dimensionless tidal formabilities, the lambdas, and the F mode frequencies or the angular F mode frequencies here as the omegas um, are shown here. We can think of this system as a harmonic oscillator and it's approaching resonance, um, dissipating more energy, accelerating the merger even faster. This regime is known as the dynamical regime and dy dynamical tides. We use universal relations to calculate lambda from the F mode frequencies currently, but these are reliant on some assumptions, assuming GR, assuming particular equations of states. And so by measuring these quantities independently, we can test all of these assumptions. The F mode frequency is also directly related to the equation of state. So measuring it would provide extra constraints on the equation of state. Now, in our waveform model, we capture tidal information within the phase, and we do this by splitting it up. We split the phase up into a point particle, essentially a binary black hole phase, into an adiabatic phase and into a dynamical phase. Adiabatic being dependent on these lambdas and the dynamical being, effect, uh, being dependent on the lambdas and the F mode frequencies. The dynamical tides, much like any tides, are maximized by small masses, um, small total mass, and also by stiffer equations of state. And they become relevant at about over 800 hertz. They're commonly contextualized F modes as a post-merger quantity. However, at these really high frequencies in the post-merger, it's unlikely that we will measure these, uh, these F mode frequencies in the post-merger anytime soon. However, they do have an imprint in the in spiral for the individual neutron stars, which is what we look at in this case. And this above 800 Hertz will be available for next generation, third generation 3G detectors. So in this work, we look at the distinguishability of dynamical tides in third generation detectors. And we also look to measure the F mode frequency and see how well we can measure it. So the way we do this is that we make a distinguishability criterion here. We follow Limbom, Limbom um, and we use two signals to find the SNRs that we require to be able to distinguish the adiabatic and the dynamical and really measure these dynamical effects. So here we have H1, H2 as our two signals, one of which contains just the adiabatic effects and the other contains the adiabatic and the dynamical effects. And we calculate this using a match and a noise weighted um, in a product as well. Here we show the distinguishability SNRs, the SNRs that we require to be able to theoretically measure these dynamical tides. Um, and in our waveform model here, we did use universal relations to calculate our F mode frequencies. So here we show for the Einstein telescope and we show for Cosmic Explorer, as these are the third generation detectors that we consider. Um, and the contours here, the colors, these show the SNRs that we require to be able to disentangle the adiabatic and dynamical tides. So you can see it's a function of the masses, as we said, smaller total mass um, means that the dynamical contribution is increased, so less SNR required. And here the 
black star, this represents a GW170817 like system. So you can see for the Einstein telescope, we would require an SNR of about 80, and for Cosmic Explorer, around 100. Now, we did calculate what we would have expected GW170817 to um, have an SNR of, and we're looking at around in the thousands here. So we can see that these SNRs are easily, easily achievable um, in 3G. Moving on, we then apply this to a population. Um, so we apply this to a population of 10 sets of 10 to 4 events. We draw our masses from a double peaked Gaussian mass distribution and we do an SNR cut of um, 0.5 um, in redshift. Um, we do an SNR cut of 8 and a distance cut of 0.5 because we require these really high SNRs, as we just saw, to be able to distinguish these effects. This is particularly for um, an equation of state called APR4, which is quite a soft equation of state. So it's worth keeping in mind that all of these um, measurements here are kind of a worst case scenario because we said that stiffer equations of states maximize the effects more. So we're looking at equations of state that don't maximize these as much. And you can see in our population here, we actually find that the vast majority of events, 96%, recover no tidal information at all. We find that the SNRs that we require um, are much, much um, higher than the SNRs that we get as our optimal SNRs. Um, so these are indistinguishable from binary black hole signals. The only thing to be able to tell that these were binary neutron stars would be the masses. Um, however, keeping in mind the vast, vast amount of events that we're going to be expecting within these times, we will still get quite a few signals. Um, so we would expect about 10 to the 4 events per year, which means that we're looking at about an order of 50 signals per year where we would be able to distinguish these dynamical effects, which is still quite promising given the amount of uh, detections that we are looking at today. Now, the distinguishability criterion um, it is a useful um, gauge to see what events might be able to measure these dynamic effects. However, it doesn't tell us actually anything about the accuracy to what we can measure dynamical tides. So for the next part, part of our um, analysis, we do full Bayesian parameter estimation on one mock signal. So this is one case. And again, it's a GW170817 like event. Um, so we put this in an Einstein telescope cosmic explorer network, um, and we find our posteriors here. So using uniform priors, we get our F mode frequency posteriors uh, for our individual neutron stars. So here we're not looking at angular frequencies, we've just converted these into hertz. Um, and you can see here that these are actually quite wide posteriors. We do measure the F mode frequencies to a few hundred hertz. Um, however, we do get wider posteriors than we do expect. Is that two minutes? Two minutes. Yeah. Um, and this is because we see quite large correlations with our um, dimensionless deformability. You can see the correlations shown here in our posteriors. Um, this is something that we observed. You can see the true values in black here. Um, and although we tend to measure these dimensionless deformabilities individually, um, it is known that they are much better measured as a um, joint constraint here. So here, this is the joint parameter for the dimensionless deformability. Much like we have the chart mass and chi effective for the spin, it can be much better to measure these with joint parameters. And you see that unlike in the last slide where we measured it much poorer, we measure our tidal deformability much better with a joint parameter. So we pose that we can do this as well for our F mode frequencies. And we pose a joint parameterization for the F mode frequencies. And we take this directly from our waveform model. This is just the prefactor in our waveform model. And we measure much, much better um, our F mode frequencies here. So we pose that maybe in the future, looking forwards, it would be better to measure with a joint parameterization when looking at the FMO frequencies. So moving on to our conclusion. So we 
we know that 3D detectors make the regime for measuring dynamical tides possible, and we assess that in our measurements here. We find that the SNRs required to entangle dynamical and adiabatic effects are easily achievable. However, in a population, only 4% have uh, recoverable tides, 3.7 of which of those recover dynamical contributions. Um, however, given the amount that we expect, uh, we find about the order of 50 are dynamically measurable. And we do use parameter estimation to, on a GW170 or 817-like event, measure the FMO frequencies to about a few hundred hertz, finding a significant correlation with, with lambda and pose a joint parameter instead, which we measure to higher accuracy. And that, that's everything I've, I've got. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natalie. Uh, again, perfect timing. Um, right. Again, people are probably hopefully putting their questions into Q&A right now. Um, could you, for, for me, could you say um, a little bit more about, you've got, you've got all the way to this F, F mode frequency. Can you say anything about going beyond that to specific EOS inference? Is that something you're thinking about yet? Um, that's not something that we're thinking about just yet, getting to specific EOS inference. Um, we have shown in, in, a, in a separate paper that you really do need to, at very high SNRs, include um, these F mode frequencies. Otherwise, you're going to be start to be showing biases in your tidal deformabilities. So it is important that we look at these because it is going to have a big impact on our waveform systematics going forwards. But as for specifically looking at different equations of state, well, this isn't something that we've looked at specifically just yet. Um, uh, while I was asking my question, Patrick had posted a question. Patrick Sutton. Um, hi, Natalie. Very interesting talk. Will our uncertainty about the true EOS affect our ability to interpret the tidal information? Um, Will I certainly about the true here? Um, I don't. I don't think it will. I mean, um, in so in this part just here in our parameter estimation, even though we've used um, universe relations in the parts beforehand, which do assume different equation of state information, when we do our parameter estimation here, we're not using those universe relations. When we make the waveform model, we are using them. But when we're doing the parameter estimation, we're looking at these things completely independently. So there shouldn't be any biases on our knowledge of the equation of state. Um, the only thing that might come into it is our priors. So I guess useful and careful use of our priors is important there. But using wide enough into what we um, believe should contain the true one, I don't think it should have a massive impact. 